get started with some housekeeping announcements as people are filtering in. Um, so Stefan Heckers is the CME activity director, uh, has no financial relationships related to the content um, of the activity to disclose. Uh, the presenters uh, have no financial relationships related to the content um, of the activity and Grand Rounds uh, from the Department of Psychiatry receives no commercial support. Uh, this talk may mention off-label use uh, or investigational use of drugs and if so, those will be noted as such. Uh, the CME code for credit is listed on the opening slide that's up currently, um, as is the QR code for the, uh, for the residents and fellows. Um, the code must be texted within 24 hours to receive the uh, AMA uh, uh, approved category one credit. Um, as a courtesy to our speakers, this is a Zoom webinar. Um, so the Zoom microphone is muted on the video and not enabled. So questions will be taken at the end. You can raise your hand um, and the uh, host or the panelists will unmute the microphone um, so that the uh, participant um, can ask their questions. Um, or they can also be, um, I believe, put into the, the chat the, the chat box. So it's a great pleasure to um, host the uh, annual Luton Endowed Lecture. I'm going to start, I uh, just spent a couple of minutes um, talking about Dr. Luton before I introduce um, our speaker, Dr. Lee. Um, so many of you know, but some of the, the new folks and the trainees may not know um, that uh, Dr. Luton, who was born in uh, 1898, uh, and received his medical degree from Vanderbilt and psychiatric training at Johns Hopkins, was the first formally trained psychiatrist uh, to practice in the state of Tennessee. He joined the Vanderbilt faculty in 1931 um, and was appointed as the neurologist and psychiatrist in chief of Vanderbilt um, Hospital at that time. He also played many important roles um, in uh, our state, including the first uh, commissioner for mental health in Tennessee, and he was also the director of the Middle Tennessee Mental Health uh, Institute. Um, so we honor Dr. Luton's legacy in many ways, um, including this lecture, which ordinarily is given in the lecture, uh, Luton Lecture Hall, which is in the first floor, of course, of our uh, psychiatric hospital. Um, but it is my uh, great pleasure to introduce virtually this year, Dr. Francis Lee, who will be delivering the annual Luton Endowed Lecture. So Dr. Lee, is currently the um, Mortimer Sackler Professor um, of Psychiatry at Will Cornell Medical College and also the Chair of the Department of Psychiatry at Will Cornell Medical College. He's also the Psychiatrist in Chief at New York Presbyterian Hospital. Uh, Dr. Lee received um, his AB um, in Physiological Psychology from Princeton followed by a completion of an MD PhD program at University of Michigan. Uh, he completed psychiatric residency training at Will Cornell Medical College, um, as well as postdoctoral training, uh, training at NYU and uh, UCSF before returning back to New York, uh, where he has spent um, his professional career, uh, rising through the ranks as an assistant professor all the way to professor and now chair of the department, um, as I mentioned before. His work is internationally recognized in many, many ways. Um, I can mention a few of his numerous awards, including most recently being elected uh, to the National Academy of Medicine, um, American Academy of Physicians, um, and the, uh, of course, the uh, fellow of the ACMP, um, as well as a member of the American Society for Clinical Investigation. Throughout the years, he's won a large number of awards, including very early in his career, the Presidential Early Career Award for Physicians and Scientists, uh, Burroughs Welcome Prestigious Clinical Scientist Award, um, uh, including uh, the uh, Bennett Award from uh, Society for Biological Psychiatry, uh, and many, many others. Um, Dr. Lee's work uh, has been truly translational in nature and transformative in the field of psychiatry. Um, I'll just touch on a couple of his contributions because I want to make sure he has um, enough time to give his talk. But his work really spans uh, all the way from molecular genetics, cell biology, um, animal model systems, all the way up to human neuroimaging. And his work really focuses on understanding how genetic variants um, associated with psychiatric risk susceptibility exert their physiological, cellular, biological effects. 
And by doing that, really gain a deep understanding about how genetic variance and genetic susceptibility is translated at the biological level into disease phenotypes um, and susceptibility for psychiatric disorders. He's focused a lot of his career on a particularly important uh, genetic variant in the BDNF gene. Um, this is the so-called VALMET polymorphism that many of you have heard about um, and has conducted seminal work in this area, understanding the neurobiology of BDNF signaling and how this particular polymorphism um, exerts its effect on psychiatric disease vulnerability. Uh, much of this work has been published in seminal journals, including Science, Nature Journal, Cell, Neuron, um, and many, many others. So um, Dr. Lee will be talking about um, some of his work in this area around growth factors and um, how going from the genes to the molecular biology of BDNF to the cell biology and ultimately up to the human translation and human neuroimaging has gained tremendous insight into how genetics, um, molecular biology, cell biology, and circuit neuroscience advances the field of psychiatry um, and our understanding of the pathophysiology of stress-related psychiatric disorders. So with that, I'd like to turn the floor over to Dr. Lee and welcome him. And again, welcome to Vanderbilt virtually, and we look forward to your talk entitled Translating Neurotrophin Biology to Understanding Risk for Psychiatric Disorders. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Yes, sir. First of all, thank you so much, Sachin, for that very generous introduction. Um, before, as Sachin mentioned, that I um, have, will be talking to you about uh, some very basic neuroscience research that my lab and others, my, my collaborators have been doing. But before I do that, I just want to take a step back. Uh, well, first of all, I, I, I want to make sure I have my disclosures. Uh, I get research funding and I'm a scientific advisor for these foundations and for one pharmaceutical company for which I received no financial compensation. So what I wanted to, before I talk, go over the, the data for the, the research I'll be discussing, I wanted to just take a few steps back because in addition to running a lab, I also run a, a department of psychiatry in a major in, in New York City. And we just went through a, probably one of the most stressful years in terms of dealing with the pandemic. And during this time, I actually read a lot of history about pandemics and I was, came across this quote, I think, which is really sort of encapsulates for me what how I think about this pandemic, which is that this, that this the, the pandemic actually put pressure on the society and it revealed things that were, were not that evident. And, and you can imagine that many things were revealed, but what, what, what we are also dealing with right now post uh, sort of the surge in pandemic is what some people call the second wave, some people call it the fourth wave, but after the sort of the immediate mortality and morbidity of COVID-19, we are seeing this sort of wave of, 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 of cases that are emerging and especially those with pre-existing conditions, especially for anxiety and depression. All, all our inpatient units as well as our outpatient clinics are at, at this point, at, pretty much at capacity. And during this time, it really made me think about, about our field and what we need in our field. And ultimately, in addition to obviously making sure we can try to expand access and do things much more efficiently in terms of services delivery, what it really sort of hearkened to me is that we really do need to double down and really make significant efforts into try to connect sort of um, uh, sort of the clinical mission that we have with the ultimate research mission, which is ultimately to find new targets and new treatments for our psychiatric disorders. Because ultimately, the only way we will ever be able to flatten curves like this is if we are able to bring a new array of biomarkers and new new medications or circuit-based interventions. And I just, and I think what I'm gonna be telling you in the next 40 to 45 minutes are two vignettes. Um, and they're not the only vignettes, but of what we need to do in, as a field in terms of trying to leverage sort of the new advances in neuroscience as well as, as, as computational biology in order to try to move this needle. And, and even though this is probably not, I'm gonna be showing some fairly basic neuroscience work, I think this is what the field needs to basically realize that it still needs to do. It needs to essentially find things that had not previously been found in order to try to rethink what we can do for, for our patients. Yeah. 
So what I'll begin doing is giving a, a, back, a brief background about BDNF and, and this polymorphism that Sachin mentioned. I'll go fairly quickly over the second part about, the, about this genetic common genetic mutation that my lab has been studying for the last decade um, and, and, and how we went from a human to a mouse to a circuit to a molecular mechanism. Um, I'll go through it relatively quickly. The details are not as important as the strategy. And I think what I want everyone to sort of pick up from this is that, that it is not easy to do this and ultimately required us halfway through this to make some type of counterintuitive leap in terms of trying to understand its molecular mechanism. But, and, and, but most of this has been published. What I will spend most of my time is this last part, which is how we found a new role for the neurotrophin signaling complex in OCD-like behaviors. And I think this, again, is another sort of strategy we use from finding, studying a human disorder, going to a mouse, ultimately finding a novel molecular signaling complex. But ultimately, the goals for all of these is to ultimately find molecular mechanisms that can potentially become future targets for treatments, or at least understanding of what's, what, the cyst, what is going on within the, within the brain. Yeah. So first of all, uh, BDNF, which I was mentioned, is part of a family of neurotrophins. The this first member was uh, NGF. And the classic response when you add a neurotrophin to a, a neuron, or in this case, a dorsal root ganglia, is this robust differentiation response or a survival response. And since this discovery over 50 years ago, it has been shown that BDNF, especially in the brain, seems to be a key factor for plasticity, whether it be for enhancing synaptic transmission or for sort of um, structural plasticity in terms of neuronal morphology, as well as all the knockout mice that have been made for BDNF have had all uh, phenotypes related to learning and memory, as well as fear and anxiety. Um, and and, and the, I, I would say at this point, this was a, a paper that came out uh, more than 14 years ago, and, and it was from Lisa Montegia's uh, group. And ultimately, this hypothesis of how BDNF and other growth factors has really held up that essentially that stress and other um, uh, sort of environmental uh, interventions essentially lead to decreases in neuronal function, whether it be altered spine, synapses, and that, that antidepressants and other drugs work by elevating these growth factors. And that this is ultimately the, the hypothesis, much more so than BDNF or any of these molecules being involved in the underlying pathophysiology of mood disorders. This seems to be the area that is, is probably the, where these molecules can be best understood. Um, and uh, uh, in 2003, it was, there was a discovery that there was a common human polymorphism in the human BDNF gene, which actually led to an amino acid change, which Sachin mentioned from a VAL to a MET. 25% of the human population has this. Uh, it actually emerged, uh, in, it, 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 it did not exist in other, any other primate species. So this is, it's only in humans. And in 2003, um, it was a, an effort made by Danny Weinberger's group, as well as my group, to essentially figure out the mechanism of action. It was, it was, uh, we found that essentially this met polymorphism led to an impaired binding to a sorting protein called sortilin, which led to a decrease in activity-dependent secretion. Um, so to, to give you a, a model of how BDNF is made, it is essentially packaged in the, the Golgi apparatus and put into dense core vesicles. And so normally it, 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 it had a sorting protein, which had not yet been identified. And then at around 2003 and 2004, it was identified to be a molecule called sortilin. And it essentially, that this point mutation actually decreased protein-protein interactions. And then there were uh, four subsequent papers. So in many ways, at this point in sort of my career and in, in sort of the BDNF field, we felt we had a very good understanding of how this point mutation worked, which is a sort of a, sort of a, a, a leap of how we think uh, various genetic mutations would work in, in, any, in any other sort of psychiatric gene. Um, so what we then did is we made a knock-in mouse and basically went through this sort of, sort of classical uh, you know, bottom-up translation where we then tried to understand its neural phenotype, its behavioral phenotype, and its re relevance to clinical disorders. Uh, and I'll just summarize this. Um, so what we, based on what we had already known about uh, BDNF, we knew that we could do a learning paradigm such as fear extinction, where you train a mouse to do, uh, to 
to freeze to a tone after it's been shocked three times. So this is classic Pavlovian uh, type learning where they now associate the tone with a, a dangerous, uh, with danger. And then if you play the tone over and over again, you can actually decrease make this previously dangerous to less, um, no longer dangerous. And this is a form of learning called uh, fear extinction. And if you are a wild type mouse with a VV, you're able to learn fairly quickly by the late trials uh, that as the tones are being played over and over again, that this previously dangerous tone is no longer dangerous. If you have one or two copies of the methylene, this, you, you do not have this type of plasticity to learn and you continue to freeze uh, as you hear the tones. Um, my colleague BJ Casey at the time, who was at the Sackler Institute, did the same parallel study in humans, but instead of shocking them, paired a yellow square with a loud noise and then monitored sort of autonomic response by measuring sweat on, on their subjects' fingertips and basically showed that there was a similar uh, trend where basically um, as repeat presentations of the yellow square, that there was sort of decrease in the amount of sweating or, or galvanic skin response. And that if, one, if you had one copy of the methylene, that you would not be able to do this. So this is one of the first examples of studying a point mutation or a genetic mutation in a parallel study with mouse and humans related to, uh, in particular, with fear learning or fear regulation. Um, and then what BJ was able to do with her graduate students and postdocs is basically study the functional neuroanatomy of this by, by basically doing imaging as the yellow squares were being presented. And so what she was able to show was, was that the prefrontal cortex, as in the late trials, was actually being engaged and there was more blood flow into the prefrontal cortex, and that if you had the variant allele, you, um, you did not sort of engage the prefrontal cortex. But what, what's the, the sort of the power of functional neuroimaging was that she could also do the simultaneously look at the amygdala responses in areas where it's known that this is where the, the fear responses are, are based and show that you could get a uh, sort of a, 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 a parallel decrease in, in humans with, with the vowel allele, but those with the met allele still had engagement of the amygdala as the yellow squares were being presented. Um, so this ultimately led us to, um, a f we, we were very happy with this result because it really suggests that we had found a single amino acid change that actually led to alterations in learning in both uh, a knock-in mouse with the, with the human allele, as well as uh, in humans with, who were carriers of the allele. So th at, at this point, we were quite satisfied. We had figured out the molecular mechanism, we had figured out and gone all the way up and studied it in humans. Um, however, after we published our paper in Science in 2010, two other series of papers came out in Science and in, other, and in uh, Neurobiology of Learning and Memory that essentially, if you take uh, in mouse models, half of the BDNF away, you get normal fear extinction. Um, and again, in this sort of the world of mouse, uh, in the neurotrophin world, if you cannot get one mouse to basically phenocopy another mouse with a theoretically similar sort of loss of function, this is sort of a problem. Um, so we actually then went and, and actually reconfirmed what these two other labs did uh, and basically found that it, they also had normal fear extinction learning. Um, we then went to the extent of actually retesting this with another set of, of mice and another set of postdocs and graduate students and published it. We kept on getting a, a fear extinction deficits in the VAL66 knock-in mouse. And again, I know this is more for the trainees, but it's at these moments where you have this sort of disparity of, of getting different or conflicting results of what to do. And ultimately, what you ultimately want to do is you can always fall back on becoming more basic in terms of what you do. Because in many ways, all we had to really do is stop thinking about the previously published data and just sort of step back and think about the, the BDNF gene and just think about where the where this point mutation was. It was actually not in the sort of the mature domain that binds to the receptor. It was actually in the pro-domain, which we thought was mainly involved in trafficking. And this was sort of the basis of how we thought uh, the, the top, uh, how this polymorphism worked. But if for a moment, instead, we just considered the possibility that this pro-domain was not some type of trafficking cassette, but actually its own ligand, 
then you, we could imagine that this was not a loss of function mutation, it was actually a gain of function mutation. And so that the prodomain with this point mutation might be actually a new ligand that nature created for human beings. Um, and this is the hypothesis we had uh, around four years ago. And so what we first did, we, we, we went back and looked and s to see whether, so we, we purified the prodomains did NMR mass spectroscopy and saw this very subtle secondary structure defect from a, from a, 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 a beta strand to an alpha helix. We went and did cryo EM and showed that actually this, it actually aggregated in a much different way, whether you had the ancestral val allele versus the ancestral uh, or the mutant met allele. So it again, suggests, gives us more confidence that there's something different about the pro-domains of these. Um, and so I'm going to summarize four year, three years of work showing that ultimately what we found was, was that in the dense core vesicle, there is a cleavage of BDNF from a mature domain and a prodomain, and that, that the mature domain binds to its canonical receptor tyrosine kinase. The prodomain actually binds to two new sets of receptors, one called source CS2. The names of these are not that important, but that and at P75. But ultimately, we, uh, and the, the data we have for this was done mainly in vitro, in human eye, in, in hippocampal neuronal cultures, but that normally if you have purified valve prodomain, it has no effect on these sort of protrusions or spines uh, in hippocampal neurons and either at, at zero after 60 minutes, but then if you add the MET prodomain, it will actually rapidly change the, uh, the, uh, the shape of this spine to one that is now thin instead of mushroom shaped. And there's actually no loss of the total number of spines. It's just the, the change in the morphology. Uh, we went and showed that actually, if you just focus here, that you actually not only make the spines thinner, you actually lose so its presynaptic contact. And we used a presynaptic marker bassoon to show that. And so in addition to it changing its shape, it actually led to sort of a loss of, of a, or, or a synapse disassembly, as we call it. Um, and uh, let's see, we then, and I'm going to skip over much of this, but we actually went and figured out the, the intracellular molecular mechanisms. When you have source CS2 and P75, you engage an entire sort of series of intracellular signaling cassettes that essentially lead to changes in the actin cytoskeleton and basically collapse of this, of this spine into a thin spine. Um, and we use genetic knockout mice to basically show that if you lose P75 or source CS2, you don't get this effect. So both are, 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 are necessary for this, uh, for this type of uh, change in spine formation. Um, so ultimately, what we want to know is we've now shown that this leads to, instead of, uh, of, of affecting secretion, it actually leads to neuronal spine pruning. And we wanted to know what circuit was involved. And we used a, a reporter mouse that ultimately found that this P75 and source CS2 was, was only present in a brief period of time during adolescence in the ventral hippocampus. It doesn't seem to be there all the time. P75 is not highly, that highly expressed in adulthood. It seems to be during this peri-adolescent time period. So what we did is we did um, some, some very old world um, uh, uh, track tracing, anatomical track tracing, looking at the connections between the ventral CA1 to the prelimbic prefrontal cortex, and basically found that we, we see actually a surge in connectivity, which I won't go over, between the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex during this period of time. And that if you have the methylene here on the far right, you will actually don't get this surge. So we essentially, and you get a lower number of connections. So in essence, we think that this prodomain must be doing something during adolescent development to actually sort of diminish connectivity in the fear circuit. Um, and, uh, and in order to convince ourselves, we use a, a sort of an in a live imaging technique called fiber photometry to look at the sort of the um, to look at uh, uh, neuronal activation in this circuit, in specific, specifically during fear extinction, which I had mentioned before. And initially, in the early parts of fear extinction, you actually don't see a difference between the gene uh, between met mice and and the wild type mice. But at, as you do more and more of these sessions where you play the cue and not shock the mouse, you actually see that the the met mice still neurons still continue to basically uh, 
become active during as the tones are being presented, while the, those with the vowel allele seem to have adjusted and, and are not as active during cue presentation. So again, this suggests that these neurons seem to somehow stay active and, and, and not, not sort of go through the plasticity of, of learning that this cue was previously dangerous and continue to basically fire during this period of time. Uh, so this is the working model we had at that point, which was that essentially you have amazingly a, a prodomain, which is essentially punishing the ventral hippocampus and causing sort of, sort of decreases in connectivity between the, hip, the ventral hippocampus and the prelimbic prefrontal cortex. Um, the only sort of glitch in this model is, is that what we are actually doing is studying a, a met prodomain that was actually expressed throughout the, the brain, not just within the circuit. So in order to do the sufficiency test, what we did is we actually took the purified met prodomain and, and gave it to wild type mice to see whether or not this would actually phenocopy what we've seen in the, in the met met mice, knock in mice. And to, what we first did was we injected it into the ventral hippocampus. And after three hours showing that we can actually get decreases in spine density, we actually went and did bilateral injections into the ventral hippocampus and showed that we could actually, just like with the knock-in mice, show, find a defect in fear extinction. Um, and that if you do this later on in life in the ventral hippocampus, it doesn't work. And if you if you inject the prodomain in a different region, like the prefrontal cortex, like prefrontal prelimbic prefrontal cortex, it does not affect uh, fear extinction learning. Um, so I, just to summarize this part of the talk so far, we ultimately found that we have a gain of function um, mutation in the BDNF gene, which ultimately uh, is in effect during peri-adolescence only, and that it's these, we found a new set of receptors that seem to mediate this other than the canonical uh, track receptor tyrosine kinase. And most importantly, the human phenotype of impaired fear extinction is probably related to this, that the, ultimately this inefficiency or in it, you know, inefficient fear extinction learning is probably due to sort of in, in effect, in a, uh, weakened connections between the ventral hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex. Uh, by the way, this does not mean that the loss of function phen uh, phenotype that we I first described actually isn't there. It's just that we had in, for a long time had not figured out the human phenotype for it. And I don't actually, usually at this point, I would continue and tell you about this because we, but it was recently published in, in molecular psychiatry, but I, I won't go over it at this point because ultimately we have not yet, we've identified social anxiety as the phenotype, but we've not yet figured out the granular mechanism of why it's affecting social anxiety in particular. Um, but what I wanted to do is switch gears at this point and talk to you about a new project that has basically um, is related to OCD-like behaviors. And, and I, this is another part of the lab that instead of working on fear regulation, we actually work on, on repetitive behaviors. Um, and so for everyone, as you know, OCD is a, a major uh, anxiety disorder that basically is uh, characterized by repetitive mental or behavioral acts such as compulsions. What I find is that even though the prevalence is relatively low, one to 3%, that essentially is the 10th leading cause of morbidity um, um, uh, as, by, as reported by the WHO, mainly because if you do not respond to the initial treatment, such as SSRIs or cognitive behavioral therapy, there, is, you, uh, there are very few options. There are currently studies done um, at Columbia and, and also at Stanford studying ketamine as a possibility, and then also deep brain stimulation. But you know that you have a very difficult disorder if these are the only options you have. Um, and, uh, and the circuitry for, for OC uh, obsessive compulsive disorder has actually been quite well worked out. Even in, by the 1990s, neuroimaging studies sh had shown that there was an, an overactive orbital uh, frontal cortex to striatum to thalamic loop that seems to be overactive. Um, and then a seminal study done by Renee Hen and Suzanne Amari basically showed that you could uh, um, shine light on, on the um, on projectors from the um, uh, from the OFC to the striatum, and basically elicit repetitive behaviors, not on day one, but by day six, suggesting that overactivation, in particular, of the of the orbital frontal to striatal circuit, seems to be key to sort of mediating repetitive-like behaviors. Um, 
And also, uh, it's also been shown that they've been found knockout mice that have other um, repetitive behaviors, in particular the SAPAP3 knockout mouse and the SHANK3. These are uh, ones that have been already also then linked to autism uh, spectrum disorders, and they all have sort of facial lesions. And, and again, these molecules are found mainly in the striatum and, um, and or selectively in the striatum or the uh, and, uh, and so the idea that, that came from, in particular, the, the works of Guoping Feng studying the SAPAP3 and the SHANK3 mo molecule is that the postsynaptic compartment of the neuron, that there are these molecules that are essentially scaffold molecules for glutamate receptors, such as the NMDA receptor or for the metabotropic glutamate receptor 5, and that essentially that loss of these will actually lead to dysregulated signaling uh, through these glutamate receptors. And, and and we became interested because we found a molecule, and I won't go over the details, called slit track 5, but you will see that it has a re remarkably similar phenotype as, as that of the, of, of the SAPAP3 and the SHANK3 mouse, that it essentially has an over-grooming phenotype that has led to these types of facial lesions. Um, and after we give fluoxetine for 21 days, we can actually decrease the amount of grooming. So it at least has sort of like face validity that this, all these mouse models, whether it be SAPAP3, SHANK3, or SLITRAC5 has this mouse model. Um, I won't go through this because it's already been published, but ultimately we found a decrease in BDNF signaling um, in the striatum of these mice. And we actually figured out it, its entire molecular mechanism. It essentially is a co-receptor for track B, the BDNF receptor and it, see, it sort of sorts it into a different endocytic pathway, making less track B available. So essentially, it is a molecule that essentially decreases, um, when it's lost, decreases BDNF track dependent signaling. Um, so in many ways, we were able to also show that if you decreased BDNF in the orbital frontal cortex, you could also lead to a decreases in group, uh, in, let's see, uh, decreases in, the, I, I don't think I have the slide for this, but ultimately if you decrease BDNF in the orbital frontal cortex, you actually will decrease uh, or increase grooming. The main problem we had and which stopped this project for a very long time is that as you decrease BDNF, we started seeing that the striatal neurons were more hyper excitable. Again, this just is sort of counterintuitive. How is it that you decrease a molecule that's involved in synaptic plasticity leading to sort of more excitable striatal neurons, uh, and, and, and at the same time leading to enhanced grooming, um, whether it be with a conditional BDNF knockout mouse or with the heterozygous uh, knockout mouse. And so this again was sort of a, a conundrum. We think that there is some molecule, that somehow BDNF signaling is somehow involved in, in repetitive or obsessive compulsive like behaviors. And we think we know something about some of the signaling mechanisms related to, to it, something that helps with enhanced BDNF signaling. Um, and, and, but again, I, I think this again is, we reached that same point that I talked about before where we, we had to make a slightly counterintuitive leap of trying to understand how decreases in BDNF signaling could actually lead to increases in, in the striatum, in acti neural activity. Um, and so what we did is we, as we were thinking about this, two papers came out that essentially that, that this molecule mGluR5, this metabotropic glutamate receptor that's involved in, 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 in various forms of synaptic plasticity was up in these uh, in those in both the shank 3 and the sapap 3 mice and in many ways that by losing these scaffold proteins that the idea was was that essentially they became constitutively active so you essentially got an overactive striatum as a result and so we we also showed that the the, in the striatum of BDNF knockout mice, and as well as in the slit track five um, knockout mice, that there's increases in mGluR5 message. Uh, and, and so just to give a very brief background about this, I think this is an extraordinarily interesting target in, in the sense that it is, a, it is a GPCR that binds to all the scaffold proteins like Homer, as well as, as ultimately with, with, shank, with the shank proteins but it signals 
by, by a PLC beta and actually leads to increases in calcium, um, intracellular calcium in a way that actually leads to an oscillatory behavior, mainly because as after activating PLC gamma, a PLC beta, it actually will allow PKC to phosphorylate its tail, but then there's a phosphatase that then dephosphorylates it. And then you get this sort of oscillatory signaling, which is very unique among all the glutamate receptors. Um, so, but most importantly, the reason why I, I, I became interested in, we became very excited about this mole, this receptor was that this is one of the g, uh, genes that have, has been found to be um, uh, uh, associated with depression. So essentially it is one of the, g, the top GWAS hits for major depressive disorder. And also it is also already targeting this receptor has been in clinical trials, mainly through either antagonist or negative allosteric modulators, either for the treatment of fragile X for um, major depression or for also OCD. And as you can see from all the findings by, by essentially decreasing um, MGUR5 uh, signaling, they, they have not been able to, to find any clinical efficacy at this point. And I and, but at the same time, what's very interesting um, is, is that if you look at MGUR5 levels in the, using PET imaging in depressed patients, it's actually lower. And, uh, and actually, if you give ketamine and then look at, do the same type of PET imaging, you will also see decreases in MGUR5 availability after ketamine treatment. So there's something about this molecule that seems to be related to uh, this type of mood disorder. And so we became very interested in, and we wanted to know whether there was some type of functional interaction between track B and BDNF and MGUR5. And so we kind of knew that there would potentially crosstalk because both of them use phospholipase C, whether it be gamma or beta in terms of enhancing calcium. Calcium signaling. So we did. We went back again, and the strategy I'm, I'm discussing is sort of anytime you run into any sort of sort of counterintuitive findings, you to do more, go back and do more basic research. Uh, and what we first did is set up a live imaging system to look at intracellular calcium dynamics. If you add BDNF as expected, you get this sort of slow wave of calcium. And just as 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 expected, that if you have uh, if you add glutamate to the, um, to the metabotropic glutamate receptor, you will be able to get this oscillatory signal. So this is probably the most important slide of the talk. Um, if you express all of these on a heterologous cell, the HEK293 cells, you'll actually change the signaling. From, if you add BDNF now in the presence of MGLUR5, you will change all the signaling to an oscillatory signaling. It will no longer look like beating, uh, track B BDNF alone. So essentially in the presence of MGLUR5, it, it, it goes through a, a categorically different type of calcium signaling. Um, and that we've done all the quantitation to show that essentially that in the presence of uh, track B plus MGLUR5, almost, most of the cells are oscillating. Um, and that we've also done a co-IP showing that they actually are in a complex together. Um, um, and then we went and did some experiments, which I, I, I think it, this is one slide will, was about a year's worth of work, but essentially if you, if you shut down the kinase domain of the receptor uh, through using a, um, a point mutation, you, you lose all this oscillatory behavior. If you actually remove the PLC gamma site, you actually may retain it. Um, and most interestingly, if you remove all the signaling scaffolds on the, on the track B receptor, you basically will still get oscillatory behavior. I think this is one of the first examples where you only need the kinase domain in order to continue to get signaling. Um, conversely, if we use a negative allosteric modulator of, 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 for the MGLUR5 side, you actually lose all signaling. If you make a point mutation that prevents the GQ from binding to this GPCR, you will also lose the signaling. But amazingly, if you actually remove the entire extracellular domain of, of this receptor, you will still get oscillatory behavior because you do, as, a, as all these experiments were done in the absence of glutamate. 
and, and I, we're still quantitating this, but like if you add it to neurons, you will see that like, for example, glutamate will give you this sort of like burst of, of, of fluorescence. If you, but what, if you notice, if you add uh, an mglur 5 positive allosteric modulator, you will get a very different type of, 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 of calcium signaling, which is very much sort of in these sort of patches along the dendrites. And if you look at BDNF, you will get almost a, a, an identical type of pattern. And I, and I don't, I mean, I'm not showing the data here, but you can block both the BDNF and the mglur 5 uh, calcium signal with uh, a, a neg uh, glutamate negative allosteric modulator. Uh, I want to just finally end, and this is the sort of the last part of the talk, um, is to say that we then went to see whether or not this meant anything in terms of neuroplasticity. So we used a classic sort of uh, synapse, the Schaefer collateral CA1 synapse, um, basically knowing that basically it was been shown more than 20 years ago that if you add BDNF, you can get a form of LTP um, and that that's been shown by Aaron Schumann's group, as well as recent, more recently, Lino Tessarolo's group, um, where you basically stimulate uh, th this sharp for collateral and basically record in the CA1. Uh, and what we found is that we were able to basically get the, uh, we were able to re replicate the original findings and that if we pretreat with a negative allosteric modulator of mglur 5 you lose all of, BD of this BDNF dependent uh, LTP. Uh, if we do this in a mglur 5 knockout mouse, you actually will lose all this, also all this sort of enhancement of BDNF dependent LTP. Uh, and finally, if you add the MPEP much later on, you actually do not get this effect. So it seems to be very important for the induction, but not the maintenance of this type of LTP. Uh, and I and I, I want to end here because I think what we have found by doing this sort of like back translation from human all the way down to finding this molecular complex is that this is something that would not have been found in some, some type of mass transcriptomic screen. It actually required us to sort of think through some very disparate and counterintuitive findings, but that there actually is a crosstalk between these two receptor systems that had never been found before. And that, that, that essentially that you can activate an, a, a GPCR with a receptor tyrosine kinase, and that if you use pharmacological strategies to antagonize mglur 5 you are probably also attenuating much of the BDNF signaling in that system. And I think this is probably one of the reasons why, for example, those clinical trials that were run using mglur 5 antagonists or ne negative allosteric modulators were probably not successful because they were not aware of this sort of link between the neurotrophin system and the glutamate receptor system. And that, uh, and that in terms of uh, its implications for OCD-like conditions, uh, that essentially that you have an entire system of scaffolds that are supposed to keep essentially mglur 5 sort of regulated. And that in the loss of, of all these interactors, you get constitutive interaction or constitutive activation of this. And that, uh, and that ultimately, this is probably what track B is also doing. It is actually acting as sort of a clamp, essentially sort of regulating mglur 5 signaling. And as a result, when you have low BDNF or low track B levels, you essentially lose this ability to regulate um, the mglur 5 signaling. Um, so I, what I tried to show you, I think in the last 40 minutes, was essentially this sort of vertically integrated approach where basically you can find phenotypes in humans or in rodent models, and then ultimately, hopefully find these types of complexes, molecular complexes. Because then now we are, are armed now with additional new targets to think about, or at least think about if we were going to go after the mglur 5 complex, and at least knowing that, that, the, that the BDNF system is somehow engaged in this process. Uh, and I think this is sort of what we will need to do ultimately in terms of moving the needle of trying to, to come up with better treatments for our patients. Uh, and I just want to thank everyone in the lab for doing this, and in, in particular, Christina, who basically did almost uh, all the work for the, on the mglur 5 project. Uh, these are my funding sources and just want and be more than happy to take questions at this point. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Francis. We do have um, some uh, time for for questions, and I think uh, I'm not sure how um, 
to have participants speak, but certainly there's the, the chat. Maybe Janine can inform us on how we can unmute um, specific questions. But while we're doing that, uh, I can start with uh, sort of a more general question about your discovery of the um, uh, sort of gain of function of the, the mutation and signaling through the, through the new uh, um, receptor complexes. So can you maybe take that back to the, to the humans that carry this particular mutation? And do we know about, for example, their differential response to SSRIs? And does that tell us something about how SSRIs might be working? You, you showed the beautiful translational data on the fear extinction impairment that paralleled the mouse model. What do we know about, but you also mentioned earlier on that you know, BDNF has been most well studied in response to its role in antidepressant efficacy, for example. So do you know, uh, or could you explain a little bit about the mutation and what we know about therapeutic responses and how that might relate to your basic discoveries? So ultimately, I, that's a great question. Thank you, Sachin. So ultimately the question is, is whether or not uh, there, if humans with VAL66 med have altered responses to, to SSRIs, as an example. What is known is that humans with PTSD with the VAL66 med polymorphism do seem to have decreases in, in ability to, to respond to exposure-based uh, uh, CBT, which is essentially the equivalent of the learning process underlying fear extinction, where fear extinction is the learning process underlying CBT. Um, I have to say that in, in all the sort of sort of large studies such as STAR-D that tried to look for polymorphisms, I think we were ultimately underpowered to basically find this. But what I would also say, and I think this is where, uh, let me just find this, this thing. So the other sort of big knock against BDNF, just so you know, is, is that it was never found in a GWAS study to be associated with depression. And this is sort of what most psychiatrists will say, well, since it was not GWAS, it doesn't mean anything. And I think this is where, but if you just look at, for example, that in addition to MGLUR5, GRM5, if you look what another major hit is actually something called SOAR CS3, which is a, a close family member to SOAR CS2, the related. And so ultimately we think that you will probably need to have, in order to have an effect on depression, you will probably have to have multiple mutations. And just like for complex genetic disorders, such as hypertension, diabetes, you will probably need to have your SOAR CS2, your, your BDNF, and maybe possibly even your MGLUR5 system knocked out in order for you to to, to basically get to this level. Again, if you have to look, look at how many people they needed, uh, you know, over 300,000 patients to be able to find these genome-wide significant hits. It just tells you that these are probably gonna be low effect, low effect size effects, but ultimately, that at least in disorders such as PTSD, there seems to be some signal that having the polymorphism does seem to affect uh, either fear extinction learning or fear related startle is the other sort of phenotype that is, so more the end of phenotype seems to be something that is also um, effective. Uh, I can't see the hands raised, so I'm not sure if there are other questions, Janine. Right now, there aren't any hands right. raised, so uh, I don't have any. I didn't see any other questions in the Q and A either. Um, although, oh, there is a hand. So, I, if you'll call on somebody, I'd be happy to uh, allow them to speak. I, I can't see anything. I'm sorry. Uh, we, uh, well, uh, Dr. Rosas Vidal um, okay. is uh, there. So, Dr. Vidal. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, nice talk. Um, question is, you found uh, this mutation is of course impairing fear domain and obsessive behaviors. Um, has there been any evidence that they're actually maybe protective against other psychiatric disorders instead of being harmful? Like, is there a role for this type of mutation being so distributed in the population? Yes, that's a great question. Like, I think what you're getting at, Luis, is why did nature make a mutation that would actually lead to increases in, or 
uh, decreases in fear of learning and potentially other types of plasticity. And I think that we don't know at this point. What's interesting, and again, the numbers are very low, but in the one psychiatric condition where, in which they does seem to be, uh, uh, where the val where the met pro domain seems to be less distributed is in, uh, of all disorders, OCD. So it doesn't make sense. I think that it's unclear, but, I, and I, it's hard to know I've been asked this question many times. Why do you have a polymorphism that actually increases anxiety and decreases capacity to extinguish fear? And, and it, 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 there is actually no answer, but the same probably reason why we have polymorphisms and mutations for any other neuropsychiatric disorder, other than it must serve some function that we have not yet identified. And then uh, Dr. Montegia uh, had, has raised her hand. So I'm going to. Hi, Francis. Great talk. Um, I had uh, two questions. So the first one actually um, is sort of the, I don't want to say um, more the obvious, but you talked about LTP and BDNF. And we know BDNF has these modulatory effects. And now you've linked it to, um, you know, the MGLUR5 aspect. So have you looked at MGLUR5 induced LTD? What happens in terms of the BDNF track B system? I, that's an outstanding question, Lisa. Yes, we are working on this currently. So all this is relatively preliminary, but I think the, the, it's very interesting. And this is something, so we think that what's going on and is, is that we have not done, the, bottom line is we've not done the experiment, but we think that ultimately if you engage track B with MGLUR5, we would anticipate, and then obviously whatever this, this system is, is occupied or gets endocytosed or whatever, that ultimately if you did try to do uh, MGLUR5 standard DHPG LTD, you might not get the effect. But I think then it suggests that, that BDNF is instructive to the system, right? And then it sort of would say that if BDNF is, is, is present and glutamate is present and BDNF and glutamate will then work in this, doing this type of plasticity. If glutamate is alone, it will do then the LTD component. But the, that's a, I can assure you that is an experiment that's probably gonna be done very soon. So I'll keep you updated. And um, going back to, I, I just wanna make a point um, because there was a previous question uh, what Sasha asked, I, I believe it was Sasha on, uh, BDN, BDNF variant linked to depression and do SSRIs respond? And I think that just as a side, we've spent a lot of time and you know continuing to sequence individuals to look at risk factors for depression. But we like this idea of whatever causes depression, if we fix it, that that's when an antidepressant response is. And in the case of, for example, ketamine, I mean, it works so quickly. It's difficult to believe you're fixing a whole range of things if you're starting to respond so quickly. So it may be that BDNF, I mean, at least our thought is, is that BDNF may be more important for the antidepressant aspect. And maybe it's not a risk factor for depression, or maybe again, we're underpowered because again, there's so many combinations. And I know people then come in, well, what about the polymorphism? Because in some studies, it has shown to have um, an attenuated response to antidepressants, and in others, it doesn't. Exactly. Yeah. And, and we, we've also many done risk factors. Yeah, it's many risk factors, like you said, for that question as well, I think. Exactly. And then if you study it in a pure mouse model system, which I've done and also Ron Dumont did, where basically the VAL66 mice do not respond to ketamine, for example. So it, it, there, we have mouse model validation, but when you actually go to humans, again, the number of humans that are needed to basically convince someone or convince ourselves that it is real is very, we don't have enough pa patients who have been genotyped, who have been given ketamine, I think is the, so the bottom line. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for your questions. There is uh, a question. Oh, sorry. Uh, do you, I can read the one in the chat if you like. Sure, sure. I, I'm having trouble opening up the here. I see. I can see it right now. Uh, from Peter Martin. 
Yes, it says, I am struck by the communication between systems related to BDNF and glutamate, which reminds me of the relationship between serotonin and norepinephrine that was demonstrated in depression by uh, Dr. Sulzer. Uh, is this interaction between the systems a general phenomenon? That's a great question. So we don't know at this point. I can tell you that we have done experiments with other metabotropic glutamate receptors, um, and we have not found this. To, they, track B does not help with mglur one signaling, for example, or, or, or uh, so I think, which is in the same class. Uh, so I, we think this might be very specific to this. And why nature set up a system like this is still unknown to us. Well, why would why would nature set up a system where for only track B? And the only way we can really think through this is that there must be something about their localizations within the synapse that there must be pretty close together, so that they must have uh, that the nature built a way to basically allow for this crosstalk to happen. Because I think in order for the intracellular molecules to go back and forth, they actually need to be pretty close. So it, it might be quite specific you know, for this system, or at least in terms of BDNF uh, and mglur 5 BDNF receptor and mglur 5 All right. I don't see any other questions in the chat. Um, uh, Dr. Rosas Vidal added one to the regular chat and not the Q&A chat. Okay. Uh, Francis, can you see that or should I read it out loud? Well, I, I see another one okay. from Dr. Ju Won Kim. Okay. It says, mglur 5 has been known to be involved in LTD. Have you also tested the effect of BDNF on, uh, this is, I think, a question that I answered with, that Lisa asked about mglur 5 induced LTD. You know, it's, hopefully we'll know the, the answer soon, uh, but we, we do not have the answer right now. And then uh, maybe the last question, um, you showed a table from mglur 5 modulators failing clinical trials. Do you think that mglur 5 modulators may have a role as augmenting agents to be used in combination with other medications? Uh, great question. Uh, I would just sort of say that I think that what needs to be known about the mechanism of action of these, of these, of these antagonists is, is that ultimately they are affecting most likely at least BDNF track B dependent calcium signaling, which is probably not a good thing if you're dealing with, with where you're trying to enhance plasticity <laughs> within the system. So I get a sense that what, what this ultimately suggests is that the strategy of, of blocking this receptor system might not be that fruitful and that the other, the, the converse of potentially using partial agonists or uh, you know, in some way, you know, enhancing this might be one way to actually enhance plasticity within the system if that is the ultimate goal. Yeah. All right. Well, I don't, I don't see any other questions in the, uh, in the regular chat. Um, and if there are no other hands. Uh, there just was a hand. Okay. Uh, maybe we, we have time for maybe one more question because I know Dr. Lee has to leave at, at one o'clock. So let's go ahead with the, the final question. Uh, hi, hi, Francis Lee. Yes. Uh, thank you for your great lecture. I'm just curious about the uh, pro domain of the BDNF during the processing of BDNF. I read some article, the pro uh, BDNF, the pro domain has some role as a ligand, but I might miss your points. So when you when we uh, there's a mutation in the valine 66 methionine, the ligand role of the pro domain uh, is affected or the degradation is blocked, prevented, or what is the effect of the mutation in the pro domain? Yes. Great question. So I'm sorry if I wasn't clear. If you have the val pro domain, it has a much lower affinity for source CS2. So it essentially is ineffective. So right now, as we're speaking, they've already measured the, the pro domain in human CSF and in the brain, in the human CSF, and it's definitely there. So we're, our bodies are, our brains are being bathed in pro domain as we speak. If you have the met pro domain, you are going to be exposed to potentially this type of, of, of negative effects. The one thing that prevents that is that again, as I, I mentioned that 
for, uh, just to answer your question, the metro domain has a much higher affinity for source CS2. After adolescence, there's almost no P75 in the central nervous system other than in the basal forebrain. So it essentially is very restricted. It does come back with neuronal injury. So you can imagine that there's a situation also later on in life, if you have a metro domain, you, this system might get re-engaged. But it, it, you, this makes complete sense to me that you would possibly want to in, use, have a signaling system that would allow for neuronal pruning, especially during a period during, for example, adolescence. And that this might be one of the mechanisms that they use where you only have, you have to have both of these present in order for this to happen. So great question. All right, um, so we're right at one o'clock. Um, if uh, we could give Dr. Lee a, a virtual uh, round of applause and thank him for a, a wonderful talk as well as a robust discussion. That was great to have time there for, for people to really dive into uh, some of the, the, these details here. Uh, thank so thank you, Francis, for joining us uh, this afternoon. And uh, we hope to see you at some point in the future yeah. in person at Vanderbilt. Yes, it was great being with all of you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you.